Well, good evening and welcome to Faith Bridge. Thank you all so much for being here on this very special Monday Thursday service. My name is Adam McIntyre. I am the young adults pastor here at Faith Bridge. So excited to be here with you tonight. Uh, we are just going to jump right in. We are going to be in Luke 22, starting in verse 14. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand and Usher will bring you one. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, please keep that Bible. Uh, we love you and that's our gift to you. And the words should also be up on the screen as well. So Luke 22, starting in in verse 14. Here we go. And when the hour came, he, Jesus, reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and we had given thanks. He broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. So here we find Jesus just hours before his arrest, his torture, and his execution, an event that was utterly unthinkable for his disciples. See, he was their Messiah. He was their, their king. He was their savior. And uh, he was their hope for rescue and redemption. And you can't rescue someone uh, if you're dead. But the unthinkable was fast approaching, and Jesus knew it. And so he decides to use a meal to try to prepare his disciples for what is about to happen to him. In, in particular, he uses the Passover meal, a meal which celebrates the time when God rescued the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, and he delivered them through the waters of the Red Sea into freedom, a meal which was about to take on a brand new and very mysterious meaning. And tonight, um, I want us to try to understand that the events that transpired in the upper room and the events that take place immediately afterwards, they are a divine mystery. Jesus, as God in the flesh, uh, creator of all things, is preparing to die by the hands of his creation. This is a divine mystery. And it's a mystery that I'm afraid is lost on a lot of us, myself included. For a lot of us, Jesus has become so normalized. He's just background noise in our very busy lives. Uh, for me growing up, I grew up in a, a Christian household, and I went to church every Sunday, and I went to a Christian high school, and Jesus was dressed up and packaged and sold to me um, in so many different ways through Christian movies and Christian music and in Christian books. And as a child, I, I remember multiple times being told um, that because I'm not perfect, that I deserved punishment instead of love. And I was reminded of this over and over again in altar calls and in hellfire sermons that were laced with the threat of death. And they would look at my scared face and they say, well, don't worry, young man, there's this cosmic justice loophole and his name is Jesus. And if you just say this prayer and do these things, then you'll be saved. Now, don't you feel loved? Well, no, not really. And, and, and looking back now, I can also recognize that I was very hard-headed at the time, or hard-hearted, maybe. But um, still, it always felt to me like Jesus was um, sold to me as a formula for my salvation. He was never someone for me to know. And my teachers and my pastors and my family, they all had God figured out. And Jesus was tame, and he was safe, and he was predictable, and he was boring, and there was no mystery. And I'm guessing that there might be some people here in this room who can identify with that, at least at one point in their lives or another, where maybe Jesus has been um, presented to you as more of a concept to be believed in rather than a person to actually have a relationship with, and that there's no mystery there. Jesus is a formula. He's the correct answer to a question. The mystery is gone. Well, let me tell you tonight that if there's no mystery, the moment that you think you have the formula figured out, that you think you have God figured out, you have created an idol. 
Because the divine mystery of Jesus is that he is everything that you would not expect a God to be. For thousands and thousands of years, people have had expectations of of who God is and how God should act. The ancient myths tell us that a God should be angry and vengeful and petty and bloodthirsty and self-righteous and that they're armed with lightning bolts and a real short temper and they're always obsessed with their own glory. Even when you read the Old Testament, their ideas of how God should act are confused at best. For thousands of years, prophets and priests and poets tried their best to understand our God, who was always kind of half hidden behind smoke and fire and temple veil. And they would listen to his thundering voice, or they would listen to the whisper after the whirlwind, and they would pen a hundred inspired stories and poems that offer just a glimpse of the Creator. Even now, the debate rages on is there a God or are there gods? If so, what is God like? And there's thousands of books written on the subject every single year. Every amateur theologian has a blog. And there are shows on the the CNN and on the History Channel um, that explore the faiths of the world and their various views on God, and they're all hosted by Morgan Freeman. (laughs) And then we have Jesus, who as Christians, we claim is the fullness of God in the flesh. We claim that Jesus is, is God, and he is the opposite of every expectation you could ever have. You would think that if God were to become flesh, uh, if he were to be born, that he would be born into royalty, right? And he, he would be wealthy, and he would be powerful, and he would have a massive army, and he'd be able to defeat all of his enemies and, and bend creation to his will. But Jesus, Jesus was born into poverty, and oppression. He was born as a refugee on the run from a murderous king. And Jesus had a habit of really just upsetting the religious leaders and political leaders of his time. He was constantly breaking the rules of those who claimed to worship him. And he didn't court the beautiful or the powerful or the rich or the famous. Jesus befriended sinners and women and children He lived on the outskirts of society with the outcasts. He was rebellious, he was subversive, and he was full of love. So you would expect a God to punish evil people and to reward righteous people, but Jesus, he redeems sinners, and he made the the righteous religious leaders uncomfortable. You would expect a God to demand worship, but Jesus... He made himself into a servant who washed his disciples' feet. You would expect a God to wield a sword in his hands, distributing vengeance amongst all of his enemies, but Jesus, his hands, healed his enemies who had been injured by the sword. You would expect a God to overthrow the empire and lead a victory parade through the streets, but Jesus was betrayed by a kiss, arrested without a fight, and prosecuted without cause. And then he was beat up. Whenever I read the Passion story, I often wonder, I think about what those soldiers must have been thinking as they were whipping and punching and spitting on Jesus. They had seen other people worship this man. Who worships a guy that you can beat up? Or I think about his disciples, his followers, who were so hopeful that this was their Messiah who would finally come and defeat their enemies and end their oppression. I think about how they slipped away quietly into the shadows as Jesus was gasping for breath because what kind of Messiah, what kind of God gasps for breath? Every moment of Jesus' story is a profound miracle the divine in human form, the creator among the created, the word made flesh, a God who bleeds. You would expect a God to make someone else bleed, but our God shed his own blood for us. He died to set us free, to make creation whole again. The immortal died for the mortal. The creator beaten up, 
by his own creation, all because of a profound and altogether unthinkable love for you and for me. This is the baffling good news of the gospel. This is the divine mystery of Jesus Christ. And so when we gather together for Holy Communion, we are reminded of this good news. We are reminded of Jesus' own words. As we break the bread, we're reminded, he said, this is my body given for you. As we take the cup, we're reminded of Jesus' own words, this is my blood poured out for you. Jesus is saying here, remember when God rescued the Israelites from slavery in Egypt and he delivered them through the chaotic waters of the Red Sea and into freedom? I'm about to do that again, but once and for all. By my sacrifice on the cross, the Red Sea of sin and death are about to be parted forever and for all people so everyone can walk through unscathed into life eternal and into freedom. And this is the gospel that we need now more than ever, not a four-step plan on how to get into heaven and not lines drawn in the sand of the never-ending culture wars, but the spine-tingling, life-changing, dead-raising power of the Jesus is Lord gospel. And if you don't know that gospel, if you don't know this Jesus, I've got good news because he welcomes you to his table tonight. He wants you to be a part of his celebration. He wants you to join the feast no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you need to understand that Jesus' body was broken for you, that Jesus' blood was poured out for your sins. Um, a lot of times, whenever I read the Gospels, uh, I like to imagine that I'm walk, walking around ancient Galilee, and, uh, and I think that if I were to hear loud noises, uh, like loud talking or singing or laughing, uh, things like that, uh, it's a pretty good bet that Jesus of Nazareth is somewhere nearby. That dude just loved to party. Uh, he really did. Like the kind of parties where the whole neighborhood's invited and the Pharisees get really upset and they're calling the cops to try to break it up, that kind of party. That's what Jesus was known for. He was known for creating fellowship wherever he went. And he was notorious for often mixing and mingling with the type of people that you weren't supposed to hang out with. Prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners, outcasts. They were all welcomed to his table. If the world excluded them, Jesus welcomed them in. They all had a place to call home in the kingdom of God. They were all invited to his table. And our culture now is polluted by this stale, ritualistic religion that's marketed as the gospel, and this, it's, strangled by tradition and politics and this religious system keeps drawing these tight circles around who's in and who's out and Jesus flings those doors open and says, everyone's welcome. Everyone is welcome to my table. Everyone has a place to call home in the kingdom of God. And if you're a Christian, if you are a follower of Christ, it is our responsibility to make sure that those invites get handed out far and wide. People need to know that they are invited to his table. In fact, just after Jesus and his disciples finished the Passover meal, Jesus gave them a brand new commandment. It's in John 13, passage 13, verses 34 through 35. He says this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That, that passage is the heart of Maundy Thursday. That moments before his arrest and execution, Jesus gives a brand new commandment that we love as he loves. That's what Maundy means, commandment. We are to love as Jesus loves us. How do we do that? How do we love like Jesus? That seems like a really hard thing to do. Um, That seems really daunting, really difficult. And it it is, it's not easy. And it takes a lot of practice and it requires you to be very vulnerable and no one is gonna do it perfectly. But I wanna point us to a place to start. I want to point us to the dinner table. 
See, when we take Holy Communion together, we are recognizing that we are welcomed by Jesus to his table, that we are wanted, that he wants our company. And a good way to start loving like Jesus is to start inviting your unexpecting neighbor to your table. Uh, In fact, this is how I eventually came to know Jesus. I had rejected the Jesus uh, of my youth. I wanted nothing to do um, with him. I rejected that formula of salvation. Um, And I wanted nothing to do with Christianity or the church. And I had uh, built up my defenses where there was no sermon and no argument was going to change my mind. But what I wasn't expecting, uh, what I wasn't prepared for, was when two men, two Christian men, just invited me to hang out with them. They didn't necessarily invite me to their dinner table, but they invited me to just come and play music with them in their band. And they welcomed me into their lives, uh, and they loved me, and that's how it started for me. A simple invite to hang out with them was all it took to penetrate my defenses. They loved me, they brought me into their lives, and slowly they introduced me to Jesus, the person, the Savior, not the concept, not the religious formula. They introduced me to Jesus by being Jesus to me, his hands, his feet, his loving kindness. And that is my challenge for all of us this evening, Uh, myself included, because I know that's a difficult thing to do, to invite people into your lives, to invite people to your table. It's a vulnerable thing to do. It's not easy. Um, But that's my challenge uh, for us tonight, because all of us, uh, all of us here come into contact on a regular basis with people who don't know Jesus. They don't know that there's a spot for them at his dinner table. So we show them that they are welcomed and wanted by Jesus, by welcoming them to our table. We introduce them to Jesus by being Jesus to them. And so that's my challenge for tonight. So right now, as we prepare uh, to share in communion together, I want you to be thinking, who can I invite to my table? Because I think that's a good place to start practicing what it looks like to love as Jesus loves. So right now, Uh, we're going to take communion together. This is a time for us to reflect on the divine mystery of Jesus Christ. Um, And communion is also a time, uh, tonight we're going to be joining the rest of the body of Christ, the capital C church around the world. And not just tonight, but from the past 2,000 years, we are joining the very Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. And in doing so, we're remembering what this meal represents. Remembering The broken bread represents Jesus' body given for us, that the cup represents Jesus' blood poured out for our sins. And we give thanks because Jesus' sacrifice for us was a free gift of grace that he gives us out of his overwhelming, abundant, perfect love for us. So as we prepare to come forward, we remind ourselves of this divine mystery. We remind ourselves of who we are in him, of what he has done for us, that we are wanted, welcomed, loved, forgiven, and we give thanks. The way that we are going to do communion is that we practice open table. That means if you follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are welcome to partake in communion today. Uh, And so in just a few moments, um, I will pray, and then I will welcome everyone forward, and the ushers will come forward, and they will dismiss you row by row, and you'll come, and you will grab one of the gluten-free crackers, and you will dip it into the grape juice, and as you do, we'll remember the divine mystery, and we'll give thanks. And then after that, you can make your way back to your seat, where we're going to continue to worship together. If you would, bow your heads and pray with me. Father, you have invited us to your table. Um, You seek our company, and for that we are so grateful. Father, I pray that right now in this moment, your Holy Spirit fills this place, that your Holy Spirit fills each and every one of us, replacing whatever fear or anxiety or bitterness or anger that we have, replace that with your love, your compassion, your grace, your mercy. 
Father, I pray that as we come forward, um, we remember what this meal represents. Um, and we give thanks. Um, and that as you invite us to your table, that we invite you into our lives and that your cross becomes a defining reality in our lives. Father, thank you for the cross, for your love, for your forgiveness. And it's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen.